um, segregate these chromosomes to daughter cells. Now, in order to understand how these structures form throughout um, um, cell division, we have to understand a little bit about how the polymer is regulated. And so I've spent uh, many years trying to understand um, basically the regulation of microtubules, these um, cytoskeletal polymers. And so again, um, microtubules are quite dynamic. They, they grow and shrink in the cell and they um, um, contribute to the formation of these structures. And so the, the trick is for the cell is to control this behavior in order to form these structures at the right time and in the right place in the cell. And one of the ways that um, animal cells do this is they use centrosomes to nucleate the microtubules right there and right there. And so I've been using um, center of ditis elegans for many years to under try to understand this process and how these structures form and function. And the, the nematode center of ditis elegans shown here, um, this has been a, an important experimental model for geneticists and cell biologists and developmental biologists um, for many years. And um, you can, so I'll just describe this briefly. Um, there are two sexes of this nematode worm, hermaphrodites and males, so you can do genetics. And um, it's a fairly simple animal. So it has muscles, nerves, intestines, and skin, and germline. But it, uh, it does that with only about 1,000 cells. So it's a, quite a simple model for developmental biology. And the nice thing about C. elegans is that it develops in a very stere stereotypical way. So, so basically, every worm develops the same way. And so if you um, use genetics, say, to identify a gene that's required for a process, um, you can you can detect even subtle changes in the normal developmental program. And so we use those advantages to try to understand how chromosomes segregate, how spindles are formed, and how they function in the cell. And so this is just the single-celled embryo from C. elegans. And I've, um, I'm showing fluorescent tubulin here so that you can see and appreciate the dynamics of those microtubules as this cell is trying to separate its chromosomes in the very first cell division. Eventually, this cell will give rise to one of these worms like this. Um, and um, you can see these bright spots here. This is where these centrosomes are, are sort of nucleating all those microtubules and uh, building this structure. And you can't see the, the uh, chromosomes here, but this cell is trying to pull those chromosomes apart in anaphase. Okay, so just to give you a sense of some of the topics I've been interested in, in the last you know couple of decades now, I've been, I've been interested in this, um, this sort of general problem for a long time trying to understand mitotic spindle assembly and chromosome segregation. So just to give you a sense of some of the topics without going into too much detail, um, I've been interested in how these centrosomes, these structures actually generate microtubules. And it's really has been kind of, it's still a mystery about how this works. Um, but the centrosomes in, in, in sort of collaboration with uh, electron microscopy tomography experts like Eileen O'Toole and Thomas Muller-Reichert, um, we've, we've been looking at um, so the organization of these microtubules around the centrosomes here. And you'll notice in the clearing there, we see these two structures you may be familiar with, the centrioles, and these are hallmarks of centrosomes. So they're always at the center of the centrosome. And the microtubules, this vast array of microtubules around, forming around these centrosomes. And in my lab, um, previous graduate students, Karen Lang and Cheryl Han have, have uncovered a pathway that's involved in regulating the amount of microtubules that grows out of this centrosome. So that's just one thing we've been working on. Um, we've also just been studying the microtubule polymer dynamics. And so Mega Bajaz, a, a pre previous student of mine, um, looked at a drug called lalimalide, which comes from sea sponges, which affects microtubule dynamics. And I've also been interested in how these spindles are actually positioned in the cell. Uh, one thing you might not see in this picture here is that these spindles actually don't form uh, in, in the very center. They, they sort of um, skew slightly to the posterior. They move just a few microns towards the posterior, and they do this in, you know, consistently between different um, cells at this, at this stage of, of division um, in the one cell embryo. And so we've been studying this as well with my graduate student, Eva Gusnowski and postdoc Tega Dungu. And then finally, um, we've also uncovered with, with uh, my gr previous graduate student, Karen Lang, we've uncovered a pathway where the centrosome seems to regulate the assembly of certain kinetic core components. Um, and the kinetic cores are just this machine that grabs onto the microtubules and it's, it connects the chromosomes to the microtubules to allow the chromosomes to be pulled apart. 
And so we we did un un uncovered this pathway of of regulation of of assembly of a kinetic or protein complex called the SCA complex, which depends on a centrosomal protein for that. Okay, now I've told you quite a bit about these mitotic spindles, these beautiful structures shown here, and how the centrosomes you know nucleate these vast arrays of microtubules to form these structures. But I've been also been interested in for quite a while in another type of spindle that forms in these worms. Uh, and this is the female meiotic spindle. And you can see it looks very different from the mitotic counterpart. And uh, this, is, this type of a, a spindle forms in other animals, including humans. And it forms without centrosomes. So female meiotic cells, they actually throw away their centrioles so that they uh, don't have the ability to make centrosomes. And they build their spindles in a very different way. And I've been interested in understanding how these structures segregate their chromosomes. Incidentally, they're also very similar to what happens in plants. Plants also don't use centrioles. And again, in, with, in collaboration with an electron microscopy um, tomography expert, Stephanie Reitemann in the University of Virginia, and also a computer modeling expert in uh, Sebastian Furtower in New York, we've tried to understand the organization of these microtubules in the meiotic, female meiotic spindles. And here you can see the chromosomes aligned with the, you know, this array of microtubules around surrounding those chromosomes. And uh, incredibly, within a few minutes, this transforms into this other structure where the microtubules are formed or sort of between the separating masses of chromosomes in meiosis. And so we're interested in how this happens um, and also um, how the chromosomes even segregate using this kind of a, a, a spindle. Okay. But what I want to talk to you about today is, is, is related to this topic, and it has more, though, to do with understanding. Sorry, I'm just going to move this thing here. It has more to do with understanding how um, myotic divisions are controlled with fertilization. And so I did tell you about this in cartoon format, the fusion of these gametes, the sperm and the egg, in order to make the new organism. But I didn't tell you where those cells come from. And it turns out that they come from a, a specialized cell division process called meiosis. And in the male, um, during meiosis in the germline of the male, um, the male starts out with um, cells that are like this cell down here um, with two copies of, of the chromosome of the genetic material. And in, in a specialized division called meiosis one, those um, a, a copy from each of the parents is, is separated into two cells. And then another meiosis division called meiosis two occurs where those single chromosomes are separated into individual cells and these become the sperm um, which have only one copy of each of that genetic material which can then fuse with another cell that only has one copy so that's the whole point of meiosis is to reduce the copy number of the genome um, and that's pretty simple in males maybe but um, in females it's a little more complicated and so in the females meiosis um, they start out the same way but they undergo a very asymmetric division. Typically in most animals, they do this. And so those, those cells, when they divide, they create one very small cell that we call a polar body. And they actually just throw that DNA away, that chromosome away. And then they continue with this large cell and they go through another meiosis division and they um, throw that genetic material away. And they're left with one single cell with that one copy of, of the chromosome there. Okay. now. Um, again, in the textbook view, everything's fine. These cells then fuse to form the zygote, but um, the reality is it's, it's, again, much more complicated in many types of animals on Earth. And the, the fact is that quite often the sperm fertilizes up in this stage of this development of the, of the female meiosis. And as I'll tell you today, worms and insects, worms do this um, during just before this meiosis one division. So the sperm actually enters before this happens. And in vertebrates like humans, um, these cells arrest at meiosis two and they wait for fertilization at this stage and they only complete that division after the sperm enters. And so just related to humans, again, just another uh, bit of information. So the in humans, the this cell here is actually present and already um, born and it's already gone through recombination and everything when a female is, a, is, a, is still a fetus, actually. And so then those cells and, the, and all of the cells that they use for reproduction are all born at this stage and finished by this stage and arrested here. 
And those cells then just wait and they stay arrested at that stage for over a decade until puberty. And then once a month through due to a hormone pulse, we'll, we'll do this division and then they stop and they wait for the sperm at this stage. So it's a very complicated series of events with a series of, of arrests and, um, and, and it has to be coordinated with fertilization. Now, the problem with humans is it, again, it takes over a decade to study this whole process. If you were to study this whole process and it wouldn't you know, be, it would be invasive and probably, you know, it wouldn't be ethical and it would be very difficult to study that process. But the advantage of the worm is that um, we can study that whole process um, and we can actually image it within one hour. And in this cartoon, I'm just going to describe how this works in the worm. Again, they're hermaphroditic. They fertilize themselves. The, the worms make about 100 sperm in each of these sacs called spermatheca, and they store them there. And then they fertilize their own oocytes. So they don't make any more sperm after this, but they fertilize their own oocytes one at a time. And the oocyte in this cartoon just comes through the spermatheca, um, this little sac here. And at this time, these these sperm, they now the sperm and worms don't have tails. They're not flat. They don't have flagella, but they crawl. They're amoeboid. And so the oocyte comes through the spermatheca. And at this stage, the sperm become active to crawl. And so there's a nematode sperm there crawling. And these guys, once activated, one of the sperm will actually enter the cell and fuse with it. Okay. And I just wanted to show a movie uh, that I made showing this process here. So what we're going to see is, a, is one of these oocytes come through the spermatheca. And I'll just point out that the microtubules are in green here. Um, this, this is the start of that meiotic spindle I talked about. And these are the sperm. So the, they're just labeled with cr the chromatin M cherry label so that we can see the DNA. The sperm are very small. You can't really see the whole thing, but you can see the nucleus here with the, with the red dot. Okay, and so this cell goes through the spermatheca and very quickly a meiotic spindle forms. You can see that. And I'll just stop it there. So um, you can see that the chromosomes have se are segregating already uh, within a, about 10, 15 minutes. And the DNA from the sperm, you can see it right there, hopefully, is already in this cell. So um, this thing is still now has to undergo this division and one more. So it finishes this and makes a small polar body and throws it out of the cell and instantly um, makes another spindle right there and stop it. You can see six chromosomes in worms, one, two, three, four, five, six, and they quickly line up and we see segregation of this in meiosis two and another polar body, which gets thrown out of the cell. And at this stage already, you can see nuclear envelopes forming around the DNA that's left. And we can start to see this microtubule um, network coming off of a centrosome already here. And so I told you that uh, worms get in female meiosis, they get rid of centrioles, they throw them away, um, but it, the centrioles come back with the sperm. The sperm bring the centrosomes uh, or centrioles back into the cell and then they form centrosomes, which are required for that first mitotic cell division shown right there. Okay, so the chromosomes separate and the cell will again divide over and over again to create the worm. And so again, if you look at the time, um, this all happens within about an hour. So that we started at minus 16 up into anaphase, which is at the zero point here, right there where the chromosomes are segregating. And this whole process takes about an hour. So we can watch this and we can look at for differences and use this as a tool to understand the process. Now, a lot of work has gone on in, in the C. elegans community to understand this um, sort of the process of cell division um, from these, these oocytes into the transition into the mitotic cell divisions. And primarily work from the Ward lab and David Greenstein's lab and, and others, um, we now know that the, the trigger for this very, to sort of exit this arrest here, comes from a, a hormone-like protein that's secreted by the sperm. So the sperm secrete this thing, it's called major sperm protein, and it acts like a hormone, and it triggers this cell to exit this arrest. So this is a kind of the arrested oocyte here. And it works through this, through this sheath cell as well as the oocyte, but basically the cell then is triggered to enter into metaphase here, build that spindle. And within about five minutes or so, 
um, the sperm actually crawls right in and fuses with that cell and brings those two centrioles with it and the DNA. But they don't do anything else. They sort of lay in wait, in quiescent, uh, quiescence here, and wait for the meiotic cell divisions to finish. And so this cell then will go into anaphase one and segregate that chromosome, those chromosomes, throw out, throw them out in, in the form of a polar body, and go into meiosis two and make that spindle and then make the second polar body and only after that is finished do the does the cell start to nucleate microtubules from those centrosomes so this is just a cartoon representation of the movie i, I showed you but importantly um, this sort of signal is what triggers this exit here so um, one of the interesting observations though that was made by sam ward's lab and also um, uh, later by frank mcnally's lab is that if you take a sperm that actually can't fertilize so this thing can you know um, release that hormonal signal and trigger this cell to go in but if the sperm doesn't crawl in something interesting happens these cells um, go from uh, all the way into this anaphase stage just fine but then they abort that and the chromosomes come back in and they don't do meiosis 2 they skip meiosis 2 and they go straight to mitosis okay so that's interesting and was interesting to me because what that suggests is that there's a signal that uh, also comes in with the sperm that these cells need. So they need to, to get something from the sperm after it gets into the cell. And this is true for, um, you know, basically every, or, every organism that um, fertilizes cells like this. And the, the, the big issue is that we don't know what the signal is. And in worms, people have been looking like at this problem for uh, over three decades to try to find what the signal is that comes in with the sperm that's required to complete this process. So there's really two signals, one early one that comes from outside, but there's evidence that there must be something that the sperm provides in order for this. And, and um, people have looked hard at this problem to try to find what this is. And I just wanted to illustrate there's lots of genes required for the whole process of making the sperm here, shown here, lots of these genes, lots of genes required to activate the sperm to get them to crawl properly. Uh, we don't know a lot about the fertilization process, though, and we know even less again about what that signal is. There is some there is one gene that's required for the embryo development, but it's not doesn't seem to be part of that signal. And of course, we know there's lots of genes required for embryonic development that I'm not showing here, too. And what I want to introduce a little bit, though, is that we've discovered a few years ago now uh, that we think we have uh, tapped into this, at least the receptor of this of this signal. So we think we found the maternal component that sort of senses the signal or listens to that signal. And we call this the MEMI pathway. So the MEMI pathway um, these are proteins that uh, we've we found that are required in this oocyte, and uh, it senses the signal, and and it's it's required to transition properly into meiosis too. And um, the other thing that we discovered in our with our work is that you need to degrade MEMI in order to get out of meiosis too. So it's required to get in, but you have to get rid of it in order to pass out of this stage and get safely to mitosis. So I just want to just give some background here, and this is work of, of a lot of people in my lab, including a couple of undergraduates, Ash Can and, and Ellen here, and a postdoc, Tega Dungu, and, and a graduate student, Miriam Atain, as well as some other people that have contributed to this in the, in the past. Okay, so I just wanted to show you how I got interested in this problem. Now, I, I, I had a mutation, and as geneticists, we often, this is how we often start to get interested in problems. We have a certain mutation that has an interesting phenotype, and at this stage, I didn't know what this gene was. I just had an interesting mutant phenotype, and it's interesting because it affects this transition stage. So we call this mutation SB41, and it is a dominant maternal effect lethal mutation. I'll describe that a little bit later, but basically, this thing makes a perfectly normal meiosis one spindle segregates dna no problem makes the first polar body but then it makes a meiosis two spindle which doesn't seem to function properly it doesn't seem to get through what it's supposed to do it lingers and eventually the sperm um, centrosomes 
kind of join it and make a really sort of messy um, state here and this and these cells all die so basically this mutation causes all of the embryos to die and they die because they can't seem to get out of meiosis properly out of meiosis two properly they do meiosis one fine but they get sort of stuck and so then eventually we clone that gene and we called that gene MEMI1 and this just stands for meiosis to mitosis transition defective so uh, we know what the gene is, and uh, when we found out the protein sequence, it turned out to be novel. So it, it's it's really specific for nematodes. It doesn't seem to be present outside of nematodes. Um, and all we really know about it is that it has um, this mutation affects a putative site where another kinase might phosphorylate, and this is cyclin dependent kinase. So this might be regulated in a cell cycle specific way. That's maybe not surprising. Um, but we don't actually have evidence yet that this is phosphorylated or or that um, this this site is is really involved in in as a substrate of cell cells um, cyclin dependent kinase. Okay, now um, so once we had it cloned, we decided to um, delete the gene. So I told you that mutation just affects one amino acid in the protein there, but uh, we wanted to know what would happen if we removed the gene completely. And so we ordered a, a, a deletion mutant. This little triangle here just stands for deletion. And so when we delete that gene, MEMI1, surprisingly, nothing happens. This uh, worm has absolutely no problems, and, and all, almost all of the embryos survive. And so this suggests that MEMI then has absolutely no function on the surface. But we quickly realized that the, there were actually two other genes called MEMI2 and 3, which um, we realized um, were almost identical to MEMI1. So these are paralogs. And, and so we thought maybe they all do the same thing or that there's functional redundancy there. So the next thing we did is delete all of them. And you can see here that when we delete all three of those genes, we now see 100% um, of the eggs um, die. So in other words, 0% embryonic viability. Okay, so that means that this is an important pathway, it's essential, but MEMI 1, 2, and 3 work together. And I just wanted to show um, a movie, I won't show the control again, but I'll show this movie of, of the phenotype. So uh, I, I showed you the SB41, that, that phenotype had that, you know, they get stuck in meiosis too, but this is very different. When we removed all three of those genes, MEMI 1, 2, and 3, these embryos, they, they start to make that first meiotic spindle, it looks pretty good. They go into anaphase, they segregate the DNA, but that DNA then comes back in. They abort anaphase one. The centrosomes nucleate microtubules immediately after that, and they go straight into mitosis. And so basically what this showed is that they, these embryos skip meiosis two completely. Okay, so the MEMI proteins then are required for meiosis two, and this should remind you of uh, this result here, where if you have a sperm that signals the oocyte but doesn't enter, it also skips meiosis too. And so this is why we think MEMI, the MEMI components are part of that signal that's required to specify meiosis too. And so doing um, some work with, we made our own antibodies, and we saw that the proteins are present in, in these cells during meiosis one, but they get quickly um, removed. They seem to, the signal goes down as these cells go into meiosis too. So they seem, there seems to be some degrade, de degradation there. And if we look on a Western blot, just to look at those proteins here, there's MEMI 1, 2, and 3. Um, and, and we see them in hermaphrodites that have both meiotic and mitotic embryos. So that's the protein is there. But if we just purify the mitotic embryos, the protein's gone. So again, MEMIs aren't they're already removed before those cells start doing those mitotic divisions. And what was interesting about this mutation SB41 is that that MEMI protein persisted. So it was present in the mitotic embryos, even though MEMI 2 and 3 were gone. And so this suggested that the reason that those have a, a different kind of phenotype is that that protein is not being degraded, at least not with the kinetics that a normal protein would be degraded. So there's some sort of delay in the degradation there. And this is what gives the different phenotype for that mutation. So what I've told you so far is that MEMIs are required for this process, for the cells to get into meiosis too. We think it senses the signal from the sperm to do this. And that um, this then has to be degraded in order for these cells to get to mitosis. 
And this mutation that we identified or started working with, SB41, is different because it gets into meiosis 2, no problem, but that, um, that protein needs to be removed. And it, and it doesn't get removed because of that mutation, SB41. Okay, so, uh, and, all, and again, all of these embryos die because of this problem. Now, um, so what can we do with this? Well, as a geneticist, I got very excited about this um, project at this stage because it told me um, that I could potentially tap into what the signal might be used, exploiting the genetics of this organism to do this. And so the basic idea is that if this protein is sort of has too much activity or inappropriate activity, then if you somehow decrease that activity, you could potentially, you know, help rescue these, these embryos. If you just lowered that amount somehow or got helped help the cell get rid of it somehow. But another thing that you know could happen is if this signal is really involved in turning memes on, if, it, if memes are sensing the signal and responding, then uh, in theory, at least, if you lower this signal, in theory, you should lower this. And that also might help lower this and, and rescue the embryos. And so this is basically suppressor genetics. And this is what we um, use to try to identify components of this pathway. Some other gene, if we lower the activity, we might be able to find um, something that helps these embryos survive. Okay, so the first thing we did is an RNAi feeding screen. And one of the techniques you can do in, in worms is, is this approach called RNAi interference. And it's basically just, uh, if you make a double strand RNA to any gene, and you put that in the worm, this will knock out the function or knock down the function of that gene in the worm. And um, the nice thing about worms is, is um, they normally eat E. coli bacteria, and you can just get that bacteria to express a, a double strand RNA for a single gene that you're interested in. And when the worm eats that bacteria, the double stranded RNA inactivates the gene in the whole worm. And what we're interested in is what happens to those embryos that get inactivated. And so we had a library of about 16,000 genes, almost all of the genes in the worm. And we set about to test every single one of them to see if we could rescue this problem that's caused by SB41. So in, we used 48 well plates, we put bacteria on there. Again, each well has a different gene that expresses double stranded, a different a double strand RNA. And we put this worm on there and um, using uh, you know, a lot of work from undergraduate students, Ash and, and Ellen and technician Kelly. This took over a, a, a couple, almost two years, I'd say a year and a half to, to look at every single gene. We had to use micros, microscopes to look at them to see if it helps or not. And so what we're looking for is any surviving progeny. Remember this mutation, nothing survives, but we're looking for a different gene that might help. And so this is just a summary of the data. These are Excel sheets that show all of the genes we tested. And we actually did this three times to make sure. And uh, it's a kind of a risky project because we didn't know what we would get. Uh, it took a long time. But in the end, we found two things that helped these embryos survive. And those two genes were called GSP3 and GSP4. And you can see here the survival um, of the embryos compared to SB41s where nothing survives. And so we get about 50% survival here with this treatment of the RNAi. Now it turns out as the GSP3 and 4, um, they encode something called GLIC7 phosphatase. And this is um, um, basically a yeast prototype member called GLIC7 for glycogen phosphatase or glycogen synthase phosphatase. Um, and um, these two genes, it turns out, are almost identical to each other, just like the memes. So GSP3 and 4 are 98% identical. And so in fact, the RNA knocks both genes down um, for either of those two genes. And what do they encode? Well, they, these are PP1 phosphatases, okay? So they dephosphorylate some protein. But what was most interesting to us is that these genes were sperm specific. And so some work had already been done on these genes from, from Diana Chu's lab. And um, they found that the GSP3-4 those genes are required for sperm meiosis too. And they were also required for the activation of spermatids. So again, when sperm become activated to crawl, they start out their life like this, just quiescent, and then they start crawling. And it seems like GSP34 is required for this transition. 
and also for the dynamics of, of the polymer that's used for crawling in the sperm. And the polymer that's used for crawling in sperm is actually this protein called MSP. And I've already told you that MSP is this signaling protein that stimulates the oocyte to kind of go over that, out of that arrest and, and to mature. And, but it turns out it has another job and it's, and it's kind of weird, but this protein also is the cytoskeletal polymer that is used for these for this crawling behavior in, in nematodes. So, so these cells don't have actin and they don't have tubulin. Instead, they use MSP polymers to help them crawl. Oops. Okay, so this is the MSP major sperm protein again. And from Dynachu's lab, I'll just show some pictures here that they showed that um, MSP shown in red here is in the pseudopod, which is this part that um, is basically propelling the sperm forward. And that GSP is, is sort of concentrated at this base in between the pseudopod and the rest of the cell. Um, but, it's, it, but GSP is sort of all over, but it's mostly concentrated, I would say, in the pseudopod and also at this region. So GSP is there and they, th and they think it, it regulates the dynamics of the polymer as well during the crawling. Okay, so so far, um, then based on what I've told you, GSP34 was a good candidate for this signal and it's in the sperm, but we don't really know what the connection is between the sperm and this signal here. So the next approach, we, we used another type of screen to identify more components of this pathway. We thought there must be more things and so we used EMS, which is a mutagen to mutagenize the genome and try to find other genes that are required for this pathway. And uh, the good thing is that we, we, we found about 30 things. I'm not gonna describe them all, but what the good thing is we did find some mutations in GSP4, which tells us that the screen is working in the same way that the RNAi screen worked. We're getting the same things, but we also got another gene called GSKL1 that I wanna talk about. And we got four different um, mutations in that gene. And GSKL1 um, encodes a kinase called GSK3. And so the work I'm going to talk about now is, is all done by, uh, or most of it's done by Rudra Banerjee, a PhD student in my lab. So what did GSK3 enzymes do? These kinases, well, they do a lot of stuff. Here's the slide that um, might make you want to fall asleep or something, but I'm, I'm really just illustrating that these, these enzymes really have a lot of roles in development and cell biology. Um, and they got a little bit famous, I would say, because of their role in, a, in a, an important developmental pathway, the Wnt signaling pathway, and where they are involved in degra degrading, targeting a, a different protein for degradation. But, um, but they're also involved in other pathways that are um, implicated in proliferation, cell cycle control. Um, and so, you know, this makes sense maybe for uh, an enzyme that's required to control the cell divisions at this stage of, of fertilization. Okay, and Rudra found these mutations within the gene. Um, again, all of these uh, mutations helped um, suppress this SP41 mutant. They survive when they have one of those mutants, um, and, and none of the progeny survive if they don't have it. But then he separated it away from this MEMI SP41 mutant. So he just wanted to look at the GSKL mutants on their own. And it turned out they had no phenotype. So all four of those mutations were perfectly, looked perfectly wild type um, by the assays that he used. And you can see here 100% survival of the progeny. So again, what is GSKL1 doing? Um, this tells you it does maybe nothing, but uh, we, we decided to look at other GSKLs because there could be a functionally redundant gene that, that does the same job. And so in worms, there are seven different GSK3 kinases. Um, one of them is involved in the Wnt signaling pathway in the early embryo, and that's actually essential. So if you, take, if you mutate that gene, the, the embryos die. So we couldn't really work with that one. But the, the other six, or the other five, in addition to his gene, um, these, when they're, when they're removed on their own, you can see these um, bars here, they have no phenotype or, or very, very little um problems and so what Ruder did is then he um used in this for this experiment he used deletion mutants i should mention so he um he combined them so he made double mutants with every single one of those gsk mutants 
And he realized that only one of those combinations, the double mutant, actually produced dead eggs. And that was GSKL1 and another gene called GSKL2. And so this showed that these genes do have a function that's essential and that a lot of embryos were dying. And so he looked at those embryos. I won't show the control here again to save time. Uh, and these embryos, when they come through, they make a nice meiosis one spindle there with microtubules. They segregate the DNA, they make a polar body. But then the second meiosis spindle seems to have some trouble. It doesn't extrude that polar body. And so this will lead to aneuploidy as well, extra chromosomes here, um, and they go into mitosis. So although this isn't, um, oops, this isn't a skipped meiosis phenotype that we were hoping for because we were hoping to you know tap into the signal and, and if you remove the signal you should get a skip meiosis 2 phenotype but but instead what he saw was something that was um maybe a, a sort of a a lesser uh type of phenotype or, or less severe phenotype but but related so it's at the right stage of development it's, it's it affects meiosis 2 it didn't cause a skip though but we thought well maybe uh, it's because we haven't really reduced the activity enough in these with this, these two deletions here so um, so we were still hopeful that this really was telling us something about the signal required for this stage. The other thing Rudra noticed is when he looked at these worms, um, normally worms will eventually lay eggs. So they develop a little bit in the uterus, but eventually the eggs come out um, and they'll, they'll be on the surface there. And what he noticed that um, his GSKL1-2 double mutants, they've also produced a lot of oocytes. And so this is usually a signal that there's some infertility problem and could signal that there's something wrong with the sperm. And so um, he wanted to look at that in more detail. And so he first looked at spermatogenesis, basically the meiotic divisions of the sperm. And here's a normal control to show you what that looks like in the male germline. Again, I'm using the same markers here. The, and, and the sperm actually have centrosomes. So in their meiosis, they can do this with centrosomes. And so you see them there. And this is the, I'll just go back up here. There's the first cell division um, that I talked about, meiosis one, chromosomes segregate. And then the second meiosis is the sister chromatid separating here. And everything looks fine in the normal control. You get four sperms produced by these kinds of divisions here. So that looks fine. And uh, the GSKL1-2 double mutant now, when he looked at those, many of these events showed something abnormal. And But meiosis 1 was just fine. So those chromosomes se separate properly the, right here and here. And then in meiosis 2, what he, sat, what he saw sometimes is that only one of those sets would separate properly and the other set would not. And so this would lead to aberrant sperm production something like this. Now, the other thing he wanted to test was whether the sperm are actually um, able to move properly, um, because this is also a problem that, that can uh, manifest as infertility if the sperm aren't really motile. And so what he did is he tested mating, um, the ability of the male sperm to um, compete with the hermaphrodite sperm. And so I told you that uh, sealings are hermaphroditic, they make their own sperm and fertilize themselves, but there are also males um, that can be generated. And, and uh, we use this all the time for our genetic experiments. So males will mate with hermaphrodites. They only produce sperm. And uh, when the male deposits the sperm into the hermaphrodite, those sperm, after they're in there in the uterus, they have to migrate to the spermatheca and then, then they can fertilize the oocytes. And the, there's actually some competition here. There's, once they get there, they sort of muscle their way uh, in and, and they displace the, the, the hermaphrodite's own sperm and they outcompete the hermaphrodite sperm. Okay, so what he did is he labeled the sperm with, uh, again, this cherry um, sort of marker of the, of the chromatin of the sperm in the male. And he mated these and let them go for about 24 hours or so he would remove the males and then check the hermaphrodites to see where the sperm was and in a wild type male most of the sperm makes it to the both of those spermatheca in the hermaphrodite after about 24 hours but when he looked at his gskl 1 2 mutant the sperm were still distributed all over the place um, some of them made it to the spermatheca but a lot of them didn't and it indicated that they have some trouble getting to where they need to go and this could suggest, again, motility problems. 
And so then he looked at the actual sperm as they're crawling, and he wanted to measure the what's called treadmilling. And so if you look at this looping movie here, you might be able to see um, sort of a flow that moves slowly. Well, in this case, I guess quickly back to the kind of the base of the cell. And so this kind of treadmilling behavior um, is related to how fast the, the sperm move. And so he measured the treadmilling by, by actually looking at vesicles which move back to the base. And so in a normal control, this, this occurs at a certain rate. And you can, you can see that here, hopefully, this line. Um, and in his double mutant, he saw very slow movement back to the base. And so this indicated that GSKL1 and 2 were required for this treadmilling behavior. And he quantified this by looking at a lot of sperm and saw a significant lowering of that pseudopod treadmilling rate. So this indicated these genes are actually required for motility. And this is very similar to what was reported for that other gene, GSP34. So again, from Diane, uh, Diana Chu's lab, they showed that treadmilling was also very similarly affected when you remove or, or reduce the activity of GSP34. Rudra also uh, wanted to look at um, if this protein is in the male germline. And so he used CRISPR genome editing to, to flag, tag his protein GSKL, and also um, he used another tag, OLIS, to tag the other GSKL2 um, protein. And it, it turns out just uh, very briefly here, you can see this signal in the masculinized germline. So it's basically uh, there, but it's not in the feminized worms. And so it's only in the, seems to be only in this uh, male specific germline. He also looked at uh, immunostaining using these same um, genetically engineered worms that he created here. And um, what he found is that the signal for both of these proteins seems to come on in the germline. This is just the gonad of the, of the male here. And you can see a signal at the kind of the end here. And this is exactly where spermatogenesis occurs. And so this protein seems to come on for spermatogenesis. And he looks, when he looked at primary spermatocytes, he can see the protein there for, for both of these proteins and also secondary spermatocytes. So it's, it's required, it seems to be present during the meiotic divisions of the sperm. But what was also very interesting was when he looked at the active sperm. So these are the sperm that are crawling. Um, and when he looked at the protein localization there, he saw that it was concentrated in the pseudopod. So this is the part of the, of the sperm cell that is sort of moving forward. And uh, this is where MSP, that, that cytoskeletal polymer, is found as well in red. You can see it here. And it overlaps nicely with GSKL2 here. And GSKL1 is also seems to be um, concentrated in the pseudopod as well. And here we see GSP34 again. It's sort of um, mostly concentrated at the boundary between the cell and the pseudopod. Okay. Now, most of what we know about how these sperm crawl actually comes from another nematode, a parasitic nematode called Ascaris sum. And in Ascaris, um, this movie just shows um, that kind of flow again this is a much a much um, sort of slowed down movie that you can see this very clearly and so what these these guys do is they sort of extend the polymer forward and they keep pushing into unknown territory and then they retract it behind and pull their bodies forward and it's much the same way that um keratocytes um you know crawl using actin polymerization and depolymerization but these guys use msp for this and again in ascaris we know quite a bit about the behavior of that MSP polymer. And so it seems like MSP is regulated by phosphorylation. And um, this, this allows the polymer to basically form. So you get MSP forming these nice fibers. And dephosphorylation is implicated to um, be involved in destabilizing or, or, or kind of um, disassembling this polymer. So because of what we know about how this works in Ascaris, it's possible, um, maybe a simple model, but it's possible that um, our kinase that we've found may be involved in the same process and the phosphatase GSP34 might be doing this job here. So it's possible that these proteins interact directly with MSP. We don't have evidence for that yet. But one thing that's intriguing is that if you look at the MSP protein sequence here, um, these proteins actually have nice GSK3 kinase substrate 
motifs or, or sequences that could be substrates for GSK3. And what's even more interesting is that it's been shown from this, these, these people down here that um, in the end terminus, this very region that is a GSK3 site is absolutely required for MSP assembly in vitro. So we think there's some at least indirect you know, evidence that's to suggest that maybe uh, these, this kinase acts on MSP directly. So what's interesting, I've, I've told you now that these two uh, genes that we've, we've identified, GSP34, GSKL12, one's a phosphatase or encodes phosphatases and, one, and these genes encode kinases. Now we don't know exactly how they work in this pathway, but it's interesting that if you remove the, or reduce the activity of these genes, um, either one, they have defects in sperm meiosis two, they have defects in sperm motility, they have defects in MSP polymer dynamics based on the treadmilling assay that Rudra did. And they also um, were identified as suppressors of this MEMI SB41. Now, if these genes are doing the same thing, it seems like they're doing the same thing, um, even though one's a phosphatase, one's a kinase, but if they act together, they might also be required, um, you know, doing the same thing in the embryo. And so the next kind of experiment that Rudra did is, is to test whether um, they would enhance each other if you, if you removed um, copies of, of all of those genes. So again, uh, the GSKL1 deletion alone doesn't have much of a phenotype, GSP4 doesn't, GSKL2 doesn't either. But when you combine GSKL1 and GSP4, you get some embryonic death, so you only about 70% of the embryos survive. But what was uh, very interesting is that when he made the triple mutant, this became even worse. And so it, it suggests again that these proteins are working together for the same kind of, of, of function. And, and, it, and it's essential for life. And so then he imaged those triple mutants that he made to see how they would get through this meiosis division. And so interestingly, this cell here makes a nice meiosis one spindle and tries to segregate the DNA, but doesn't. And so it actually kind of seems to abort that division and, and again goes right into mitosis. And so um, this was really the, the result we were waiting for because it showed now that these sperm specific genes um, actually have a role in the fertilized embryo and they are part of this signal. We don't know if they're the signal themselves, but they're definitely part of the signal that's required for that meiosis II division. And uh, he didn't see all, all embryos that did this, but about 20% of the embryos showed a skipped meiosis II phenotype. So we think we're on the right track, at least with that signal. And so in kind of a summary here, I told you about our work using you know, genetics and um, you know, taking some risks, but trying to find what this um, signal is that's required for meiosis II, female meiosis II. So I talked about uh, GSP34, which is uh, present in the sperm. It's required for sperm motility and also GSKL1 and GSKL2. And we think in, in, in some ways it's possible that um, this could be a linear pathway. Again, they have the same kind of phenotypes if you remove them. So it makes sense that they would be in the same pathway. We don't know the order of these things, but it's possible that GSP34, for example, phos removes a phosphate on these kinases and activates them and that they phosphorylate MSP for proper treadmilling. That's one model. Um, but again, we don't really know, and it requires a lot of work. And one of the things we like to do in the future is um, to look at MSP phosphorylation and you know, hopefully collaborate with someone. I'm, I'm looking at looking for you, Glenn or Rig, if you're here. But uh, hopefully, we can uh, set up something with Glenn and, and, and get that working. And then finally, um, this this signal that I mentioned, the MSP signal, triggers this initiation of this event. But we think that the sperm come in and bring the second signal. And one hypothesis we're working on right now is that maybe this signal is actually MSP because MSP seems to be affected by both of those suppressors that we found. And so it could be that MSP has a signaling molecule here outside of the cell, but also has an independent role inside the cell as a signaling molecule as well, which triggers the entry into meiosis II. Okay, so not sure what the time is like, but um, hopefully I didn't go over it. I'd like to thank um, some of the people at uh, mostly Ruru who did a lot of the work that I mentioned at the end uh, Rudra Banerjee here, but um, I didn't uh, have time to talk about some other projects from other graduate students, Rim, Rim Deher, Sheree Hosi-Bose, and um, Ish Jane, 
Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge funding for this program grant um, by NSERC. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Marty. That was fantastic. Amazing, amazing pictures and images. Cool. Really, really cool. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions, if there are any. Hi, it's Heather. I put one in the chat, but I can oh. just read it. Okay. Uh, yes, complimenting Marty on his beautiful microscopic images and videos. Um, I may have missed it, but did you do you know whether the polymer that makes pseudopodia in nematode sperm is also what gives amoeboid sperm of other taxa like ticks the ability to crawl? I don't know. I have no idea actually about ticks. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, it's very it's prevalent in nematodes, but um, is that how they move? They they move their amoeboid. I, yeah, I think uh, the sperm of all mites, including ticks, uh, are amoeboid, and I believe that's also true for um, insect sperm. No, Andy will tell me. Actually, <laughs> Sheila will tell me. Sheila, do you yeah. just also have amoeboid sperm? <laughs> oh, nice transition. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, no, oh, sure. now you're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> I know that... We, uh, we don't do I, sperm. I, we just do early embryos. Arthropods don't have cilia, but I'm pretty sure maybe the sperm have flagella. Fruit flies have flagella. No. Okay, all right then. It's just the uh, uh, the mites then. Mites and ticks don't have yeah, um, that's interesting. sperm. And, and it would be easy enough to look because MSP, you could you could search for that protein as well in the if if you have a sequence genome, that is. Okay, thank you. Cool. Sheila. Yeah, I've, I've, as you know, to, Marty, from many conversations about this, I've always been fascinated by by um, the, the fact that that site on the SB41 is a CDK site. And, and forgive me if I've asked this one before, but have you ever tried um, making the same mutation in those other uh, pair logs to see if it would have the same kind of an effect if you, um, like that it wouldn't be degraded and cause that phenotype? Yeah, um, yeah, we've thought about it. We keep talking about doing it. Um, and you know, with CRISPR, it's certainly, in theory possible, but the problem is that those genes are so similar, um, we would target all three. And it's, it would be just a matter of sorting them out to, 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 to make sure we get the, the two and three sorted and, and whether we could screen for them because the other problem is it kills them. And so we'd have to kind of do this at, um, I didn't mention this before, but those that, that mutation is temperature sensitive. So they die at the high temperature, but so we'd have to, it would be very hard, I think, to, to create that mutation. Uh -huh. um, and screen for it, but but it but it is something that we would like to test because yeah we expect two and three to be affected the same way. Uh -huh. Beautiful talk. Thanks. Hmm. Sheila stole my question. I'll just note that. <laughs> <laughs> Hola. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, my question is um, also a little bit related to to sort of the taxonomic breadth of these meme uh, or mechanisms, specifically those meme genes. Yep. Yeah. Um, do you know whether they are more generally distributed? And I'm asking because, I mean, if you were to look at the origin of haplodiploidy in terms of evolution, would you look at these genes? Well, yeah, I thought about, um, you know, for, for parthenogenic um, strains and something, it could be, could be something interesting there. But um, we really don't see, and I've, I've looked hard and I've asked um, sort of bioinformatics people to look hard at, at whether the memes, there's any trace of them outside of nematodes. Uh, we just don't we don't see them. I suspect that there's a functional homolog that it doesn't share the sequence, the amino acid sequence, but maybe has the same three dimensional structure that's involved in in other, you know, maybe in other organisms. But um, we're we're tapping into conserved proteins outside of memes, but for some reason the memes themselves we just don't see them anywhere else. Thank you. Interesting. Any other questions for Marty? Jacob. Yeah, Marty, that was a really nice talk. Um, yeah, so I was just curious because I didn't quite make um, or understand the connections. So between GSP, so how do you think that GSP like uh, knocking down its function is suppressing the, what was it, uh, SB41? Right. Uh, phenotype, like that sort of delayed degradation. So sort of making that connection. Yeah. So. <laughs> The, the short answer is we, we don't know much about it. Um, I, I didn't mention this, but we did an, a co-immunoprecipitation experiment, though, 
Um, and we did see that GSP34 actually physically interacts with MEMI by co-IP. Okay. And so it is, you know, and for a while we were thinking maybe it directly regulates MEMI that way when it comes in. But, but to be honest, we haven't had any other evidence to kind of back that up. And we've looked, you know, for other, you know, these two hybrid and stuff like this to see if, if GSP34 and MEMI physically interact, but it's, it, it hasn't really been backed up. So I'm not sure that that's the way it's working. It could be an intermediate. And so the intermediate could be MSP as well. So maybe GSP 34s interact with MSP and, and when MSP comes in, that might be something that signals or changes the, the behavior of MEMI. So that's kind of what we're thinking is because we've also identified the kinase GSKL1 that maybe those things interact with the uh, MSP protein and MSP might be the signal. Um, and so, yeah, we're sort of trying to test that now you might expect that if you removed msp that should also have a skipped meiosis 2 phenotype if it's the signal but the problem is that there are over 50 genes that encode msp in worms and we can't actually remove the function to do that experiment so it's pretty challenging to do this genetically to, to show that msp has a role directly in that in that process okay thank you Olaf, you have another question. Sorry, no, my hand was just left. Oh, okay, it's an old hand. <laughs> okay, well, um, it's 5.05, so uh, can everyone just please join me in thanking Marty for a really, really excellent and interesting talk. Thanks, Marty, so much. And Linda tells me to tell you that there is a departmental water bottle in your mailbox as a thank you that we would normally give to you in person. So thank you for doing that. And I, I hope I see you guys all next week at the holiday party. Until then, have a great week. <laughs> Bye-bye. Really a holiday party in person? No. No, it's not in person. It's by Zoom. <laughs> that was Ellen. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> nice to see you, Sheila. Yeah, Thanks, you a lot. Thanks a lot, Marty. Yeah, great, great talk, <laughs> Marty. Thanks. Bye.